Hello and welcome to The Wolf's Den. I'm Dave here with Mary Ellen, and today we are going to be doing a podcast that sort of centers around a question that Mary Ellen found herself asking about Melisandre. Does Melisandre really think that Stannis is a Zora High? And I said, no. I said, no, she doesn't. Because um, I just think that she knows that mankind might want to congregate around a single dude with that purpose, blah, blah, blah. You know, this single hero that, that can lead the, the virtuous into battle. But then Dave reminded me that we're in her head and she does believe that Stannis is truly Azor High, And why that's very, very mind-boggling is because of something that Maester Aemon notices about the sword, and then... Then I pointed out, I was like, Maester Aemon also <clears throat> flat out says it's an empty glamour. She has to know that. Correct. And it's even more important that she has to know it because she's the person who put the glamour on the sword. Correct. So how could she possibly think that he's a Zora High wielding Lightbringer when she is the person? Who made Lightbringer and knows it's fake. Yeah, she knows it's fake because she just glamoured a sword to make it glow. So what's going on with Melisandre's line of thinking here? Like... She's not an irrational person. Her, what I learned from reading her chapter 90 times when I was trying to figure out the pink letter and what happened to Jon Snow later, she's not illogical. She's actually brilliant. She knows like how to play the game. She knows how to do subtle things to get people to do what she wants. She knows how to, you know, hold her, you know, withhold speaking so that the person does X. Like she knows way more than most people do. Oh yeah, she's like, oh, now I'm going to be quiet. And he won't be able to take it, and he will answer. Exactly. Like, she thinks all this through. She knows how to manipulate people. She knows how to lead. She understood the trappings of power and that she needed to have guards, even though they annoyed her, because it reinforces her position as someone who is worthy of having guards and should have guards, and that automatically brings with it the authority when she speaks. And she understands all of that stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, we know she's a fanatic. Mm-hmm. But the two don't seem like they should be able to go together. Her logical brain doesn't compute in, with being such a fanatic. No, which is also really interesting, the way that George phrased Melisandre's doing her own thing. Or right. Like, that's not exactly what he said, so don't quote me on that, but that's essentially what George said. She is not there on a mission from the Red Temple Melisandre is acting of her own accord, or whatever the heck the phrase was. What he he said said. was, Melisandre has her own agenda. Well, actually, on the surface, what we learned from the Red Priests, they're looking for Zora High. Okay? That's abundantly clear through Makoro and Benaro. Melisandre is looking for a Zora High. So what is, where is the discrepancy, and what is, how, how does she have an, an agenda that's not in concert with theirs. Which also, like, I mean, I guess it possibly opens, like, a something that could be a possibility that Bonaro and her separately came to their own conclusion. Because he was asked if the Red Priesthood sent her there to do that. Right. Right, so right, does it right, just right. mean that Benaro, who is the high priest of Rulor, did not order her to go do this, and she's just doing it? Which is weird, because he could have just said it like she came to the conclusion first. That they needed to do this, and they needed to do it now. And it says, though, in those Essos chapters that the followers of R'hllor are congregating around this idea and this notion of this prince that was promised or a reborn hero or this liberator. They're all, they're all flocking to this idea. So Which how can Which also, it... like, sort of makes sense that it's building and building and building. Because True. this is the religion that's c- completely devoted to fighting off the Long Night. Well, it seems that way. I mean... There's no evidence to suggest otherwise. Yeah, I mean, like, darkness is the enemy. We need to overcome the darkness. They light a fire to bring um, 
light to the night and then they celebrate every morning because the day returned. Right. Like this entire religion in my mind seems to be built around the first long night. It probably is a religion that actually came about during the first long night. Going back to the Zo- Zoroastrianism stuff. Yes, and like the Manichaean light versus dark. Right. And to a very primitive people, you know, we're talking 8,000 oh, yeah. years ago, even in Georgia's they would cling primitive to that idea. world. They would cling to this idea. And worshipping fire, I've said this a couple of times before, makes perfect sense. Because fire is the only light in a long night. It's also the only reason you survive because you would freeze to death. I mean, in our world, there was no long night, and that still became a religion. Because back in the day, there weren't houses and light bulbs and, you know, lamps and stuff like well, yeah, that. Yeah, people valued fire, like, above all else. You you borderline would worship it. Yes. If it, you're... winter comes and it's 4 o'clock, you better find a fire. You better build one now. You better gonna, build one now be before cold. the sun goes down because you're going to freeze to death. Yes, exactly. So that makes complete sense, and it would be something that would become even more prominent in a people... That lived through a long night. In a religion that's centered around fearing that coming again. Oh, of course. That makes total sense. And like the magical signs, like once they saw that red comet, their prophecies from their religion mean it's now. We need to find this person. But the interesting thing is, Mm -hmm. is that we find out that Mel got there before the comet. Or... Did she? We don't um, necessarily know. No, no, she, yeah, she had to have been there before the comet because uh, Maester Cresson, who is our POV in A Clash of Kings prologue, was recounting all this stuff with Mel. Like, she's kind of been there. He's kind of sick of her. Yeah, he's already sick of her, but how... She had already gotten Solis and them completely on board with that faith. Stannis was still like, eh. But the but she had already kind of like done her magic on 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 Solis and the Queen's people or you know like they, they became the Queen's men or whatever, like could Mel have done this in a day or two or three like or I, like a month? It seems like it would take longer than that it would. to convince people to to throw away the religion that they've been their whole lives and pick up a new one, right? Because this weird lady showed up on your island. And, you know, there's just a lot of discrepant information about Melisandre. In one place, you'll you'll hear a rumor that Stannis went and got her from a shy. Yeah, okay, never believed that one. But then George will tell us she went there on her own accord. She wasn't kind of picked up and brought back there. Yeah. She, she went there because Dragonstone, to her, in her mind, was the place of salt and smoke. Yes, it was the saltiest, smokiest place in all of Westeros. Where the last dragons lived. Yes. So, you know, that she's aware of. And she's like, that's the logical place to Stone find. dragons, I'm going there. It's a place that looks like a bunch of stone dragons. Maybe one of these come back to life or something. Like, she's trying to figure it out. Now, she's not right about pretty much any of her assumptions. No, no yeah, she's wrong all the time. She's, she's wrong, like, every time. You know what she, the funny she, thing is, too, is that she's the best. <laughs> that's what I'm... Yeah, she's I'm the, the best in my order. She I, is the best and recognized as the best in her order. So guess what? Nobody should be dabbling in this shit. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you all suck at this. Yeah. Um, that's, what I, that's what I'm getting from it anyways. It's, Thoros of Mir seems like the guy who really doesn't give a crap. This dude's using the last kiss or whatever it's yeah, called. Yeah, it's working. And he's just bringing people back to life Yeah, he's it. like, I don't know. I just gave it a shot. I learned it once and then I did it and it worked. And My friend died and I, it was the only thing I could think of to do. So I did it. And so I did it and he came right back to life and I've been doing it ever since. Yeah, it's like... And then Beric does his, in turn, the Stoneheart. It's like, there are better red priests than, maybe not Bonaro. I don't know what he can really do. I mean, he knows how to captivate a crowd, I can tell you that much. Well, yeah. And he's like a sorcerer, which is, which is neat. Yes. Um. <laughs> well, like what Quaith said, now that Danny brought dragons back into the world, all magic, including fire magic, is stronger. Stuff's working. Stuff's like doing stuff it didn't do before. Or certainly fire magic is stronger. We don't... I, I think I think if it increases, like Quaith said, this is these people can do this now. These people can do. I think it just it's period. But all right. So anyway, so Melisandre, she went there in search of Azor High. She sees Stannis. She's like, all right, that's the dude. She becomes convinced of this, has him burn the idols of the seven. 
And his brother-in-law. <clears throat> well, yeah. Makes a sword that she has to know is a fake. So how can he be quote-unquote Azor High leading the Virtuous into battle with the Red Sword of Heroes, Lightbringer, if it's a fake? And it's even more egregious than that, too. Because when you take into account the conversation with Davos and Salador San, mm -hmm. and they determine that it's just a burnt sword, that's not even the same sword. So they took that one out of the fire. It was completely destroyed. Right. And then she gave him a different sword and glamoured it. It wasn't even the sword that came... It couldn't have even been the same sword that came out of the fire. Yeah, because he Unless said, it was, like, given back to a blacksmith and, like, reforged. And then she glamoured it and gave it to him. Yeah, be, yeah no, because they said... Yeah, right, because he goes, uh, that is a burn sword. Be glad that's not Lightbringer, my friend. Like, what... what so, all right, so let, this was what bothered me. And Saldor San, obviously, just from that statement, seems to view Lightbringer as a bad thing. He doesn't, like, see, this is where I'm, we're run, we, we ran into issues making this a Zora High video. Um, and it's like, we're in a tough spot because we're trying to make this video for the, for our fan. And the reason why we never touched this subject is because I never could, I can't reconcile what, it is. I reconcile like nine out of ten points and then one point. It doesn't work. So I don't know what George is doing with that. Um, it is a problem because you can get like nine steps in with any number of, I think at least three separate theories on Azor Ahai. Yeah. And you can get like nine steps in and it's all perfect. And then you get to the tenth and it all falls apart. And then you turn to the other option and you go nine steps in and everything's perfect. And then you get to something and it doesn't work. And then you... Go, Maybe that's his point. And it, it's very annoying. <laughs> it's very annoying. It's very annoying. But, like, it's, Mel, it's annoying, Mel is really is. has no cons. Like, she's convinced that this dude is Azor High. Because when she looks into the flames, I keep asking him to send me Azor High, and all I see is snow. She believes, truly, that Stannis is Azor fucking High. Yeah. That, that statement or that thought that just went through her head proves that she actually believes that. Stannis is he. But that but sword is a glamoured sword. And it's not even the sword you pull out of the flames. No. Because that sword was destroyed, which means you glamoured a different sword and gave it to him and called it Lightbringer. And then you believed your own lie? Maester Aemon is blind. Now, yes, he his other senses are heightened because he's been blind for a little bit now. But, like, he saw... He had Sam give him, like, a couple of descriptors through some questioning and like five minutes later after everybody was gone he's like yeah that's not Lightbringer he actually only asked one question Oh, it, he goes see? was there heat nope and Sam no no goes, no he goes what colors are there no he, yes. he, he asks him a few questions like yeah. yeah so no and then he's like and was there heat and he goes no and he goes it's an empty glamour she it's has the, to know that she has to know or is she that blind you made the glamoured sword and you think like you glamoured the sword so there's no way that you think it's the real magic light bringer because you just put a glamour on it that made it go orange, red, yellow, orange, red, yellow, orange, red, yellow, or red, orange, yellow. Exactly. Whatever the, whatever the color pattern is that it does. And, okay, here's the other thing. So he just has a fiery sword. So does fucking Thoros. Thoros of Mir lights his sword on fire, which is, so it's probably... The same glamour. No, his he uses wild, or like a touch of, oh, like, oh, some oh. sort of, like, flammable substance that he th puts on the blade and then lights it right like she like what is going on here what is going on and how come that thing doesn't bur how come stannis's sword doesn't burn thoros had to get a new sword like every two weeks and it used to annoy tygonus whatever or no that guy at uh the guy that uh, again oh, no. toboma like so how come that sword isn't burning though it's a it's a mirage it's just light light without heat Done. Isn't That's that what, right. It, that might even be what Eamon said. Light, light without, heat. without heat and empty glamour. She has to know that. What? Because light is produces heat. Going on. How can a light not produce heat? All light produces heat. But everything that one doesn't. That, everything that produces light. But that one doesn't. Heat. So what is that? Don't know. Star. 
a light bulb, anything, a fire, anything that produces With that, light. Produces that whatever heat. she's doing is producing zero heat, but it's making it appear as though there is light. It's just magic light. So you know what? That sword's not going to do jack shit to the others. No, she can't possibly think it is. Because there's no heat. There's nothing. It's empty. It's nothing. Like, what is she doing? It's a regular sword that some guy's going to run up to another with and die. Yeah, in like two minutes. Faster. However fast that Waymar Royce lasted. Exactly. Before his blade shattered because it got so He cold. He did go bang, bang, bang with him a couple of times. Yeah, he parried at least a half a dozen. Yeah, yeah. He actually, I mean, like, yeah, he did. Before his sword from touching that magic ice sword of shattered. the others got so cold that when they came together one last time, they sh it shattered. Yep. And, I mean, he was parrying with all his might, and the others, parry was lazy. And that is, like, a, a real thing with metal. When I used to play lacrosse. Yeah. You, early in the season, when it's still cold, because we live in New York. Yep. You did not use your titanium-shafted stick, because when it came together with another one, there was serious possibility. It was going to scatter all over. Yeah, and that's not good for the game, people around, nothing. No, it will send shards of yeah, metal yeah, yeah. everywhere. Um, so, that sword's gonna be that sword they're gonna the others are gonna take that sword and like break it over the knee in about one second like that sword is nothing it's like you're definitely not really helping and you have to know that you're not really helping but, but you're you devoted you are. to this and you think that you are helping but you know it's not the real thing and it's bizarro to me I it doesn't do make understand. sense. And, and like you said, is it an oversight? And I want to say no, because this is Mel's entire effing arc. How can you have an oversight on the entire point of the character? She has one POV, and George reiterates in her POV, she believes Santa is our high, she believes in this, she really believes in Rolore, she's a fanatic, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this guy covers everything, including names. It's like we were talking about earlier with the Christian Cole thing. I mean, the guy named him Christian. Oh, he Which takes means an follower yeah. of Christ, right? Follower of the faith, follower of the. Then he gave him the green eyes. You're like, was that a clue that he was a green the whole time, or something to that effect? Or, or I mean, he names characters like Dick Bean because the guy had balls. The guy because had because balls. Dick Bean means a dude who has balls. That's from Sons of the Dragon. So no, this cannot be an oversight. This is Mel's entire arc. I'm missing a serious, serious piece of this puzzle. It. It's one of those things where you run into it and you just don't know what to make of it. Is it as simple as George messed up? We, Not but, even an oversight, but he just like made a mistake. And he like, that was something that he didn't think of until it was already printed on the page. And he's like, oh no, she should have thought of that. If she's the person who glamored it, she can't think it's the real thing. But you know what? His editor, who does a lot of this questioning to him in the tabs, because I've seen her pages to him at the, um, people have posted them, they go to that library in Texas. She'll be like, wait a minute, so wait. Da -da 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 -da. That's why he uses her. Because she, she's not just looking for grammar and stuff like that. She's looking for consistency. With, with George's work, you got to have somebody who knows the story and is going to try to, is going to detail um, check you, too. And oh. she does that. Oh, yeah. She's like, wait... Melisandre truly believes that sword is Lightbringer? That would be 100% a question that she should have had. Somebody should have said that to him. But then again, it took me and you... Like two years. <laughs> years. To think of that. To think of that. Which made me wonder... That's so true. I, if it's possible that they just didn't think of it. It's possible. Because the other night I was blown away that that, that discrepancy exists. And I couldn't stop thinking about it for a little while. No, I remember when you walked into the bedroom and I was laying there and you were like, I have to talk to you about this. What about, why is this, 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 and this all together? And I was like, some, yeah. How could she think that's the real sword? She can't. You're sending Stannis with sword. a bum sword. And you know. It's just a glamoured regular sword because but meanwhile, you're the one who glamoured it. You have the little torch and you're, you're, you're yelling, everybody follow Stannis, he's a Zora Hyde. The guy's going to fall in like one second. He doesn't like... He certainly cannot cross blades with an other. And her motives are not sinister. Hand. And it's funny because Stannis says the same thing about it. What? 
Kind. That it doesn't seem like anything like a special sword to him. Right. It's, there's a there's a quote in there somewhere where Stannis says it feels like a regular sword to me. I don't know. Yes. Now I can get behind Stannis just letting Mel just you know, do her like, thing. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and Stannis, because Stannis doesn't truly believe in this. He does know that there's a, a, a war to come. He knows that he's going to need to, that mankind needs to get it together and make common cause against this, this ancient enemy of old. And I think that he just sees this as a means to an end. I can get people maybe to congregate around me or, and other powerful men to kind of make us like a united front. And he's, he, I think he views Melisandre as a tool in his belt. Absolutely. He said men fear sorcerer or men feel sorceresses or whatever. Or they fear sorcery. Period. So if she instills fear, all the better I can use that. That's yep. something that I can I can make use of. And you know what Stannis also um, finds lack he sees is lacking in his little circle? Smart people. Melisandre's not just a sorceress. She would make any power wife. Okay, like this woman would bring any guy, she would take him from being regular dude to really awesome dude. Because she's extremely smart. And especially given what he was dealing with before. Mm -hmm. I mean, Solis has got to be... She's not making any guy happy and better and whatever. I mean, she brings nothing but misery (laughs) and (laughs) asinine stupidity. And and she's kind of mean. Sucks. She's she's kind of a nasty lady on top of it. So, yeah, Stannis... um, I love Stannis when, you know, she's saying, and that's one, and he's like, oh, woman... (laughs) <laughs> get off your niche. Get stop grabbing at me. He's like, get off of me. And then Melisandre goes over to him, and Stavos is like, he's not telling her to get off of him. Um, see, Stannis is a lot more uh, emotionally intelligent than I think a lot of people realize. He just doesn't care. It's one of those other instances where George does that thing, where he says something over and over again, and has all of the characters say something over and over and That's over not again. True. But if you actually look at the person they're talking about, what the, everyone says about the guy is not true. Ex- yes. Alaric Stark's another example. That's a good example. Everyone said he was cheap and joyless and all this stuff, and Alsan gets there and and he wasn't. And he goes, and she thinks he's practical. Yeah. He lives up north. He doesn't waste stuff because winters Do- are harsh here. Yep. And it seems like everyone that I bumped into in the north, at the very least, has a good deal of respect for mm-hmm. Alaric. Oh, he's yeah. not disliked. People he doesn't- think that he's kind of boring and dry a little bit, but he's not disliked and he's greatly respected. Whereas people just like... Stannis, no, Stannis inspires nothing. Stannis is this. Stannis is boring. Stannis is joyless. Stannis is... No, the guy is just doing what he has to do. I actually sometimes think Stannis is funny. Stannis is... <laughs> Stannis, like, I mean, that's my boy right there. <laughs> Stannis says stuff sometimes. And you're, like, you're like, I would love to hang out with you because I can't stand people that are fake. And Stannis just freaking you know says what, you know, what he needs to say. He actually he has care. very high emotional intelligence. You know how I know that? When he has the, his lords in the room, he's playing them all. He's like, yeah, okay, sounds good. That's a, yeah, great. That's a great idea. Sounds good. Yep, mm-hmm, yeah. And then when they leave, he's like, wow, could they have been more fucking stupid or what? As soon as they walk <laughs> out. <laughs> he's like, they walk out and he's like, I do this because it's expected of me. And every once in a while, someone says something that isn't completely stupid. Exactly. But for the most part, I just do it because I'm expected to. But they don't know that he thinks that they're all morons. So he's doing something right. He's he's doing something with conviction. He sits there and he listens to all one dumb idea after another, and then he was like, "Everyone leave." All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna need you guys to get out. You you stay. And they're all like looking at him, and he's like, "I don't care. Get out. Let's get, go. Get out. <laughs> I would like to talk to him. <laughs> I think he might know what I he's think Stannis's about. poker face is so good that. Everyone has him pegged incorrectly. I think the, he, he has one tell that if he... Grinding. Put, he grinds his teeth. because means he, he's slightly annoyed. He hates doing this. He hates it. But hating doing something and not being good at it are two different things. That's right. How many like stories do you see... I mean, they've repeated this story a thousand times. 
Kid's an incredible baseball player. His dad's like all over him making him do it. He doesn't even like baseball. Nope. He does it because his dad wants him to play baseball. The kid's a freaking star. He's going to get drafted, but he doesn't even like baseball. Yep. He'll or play for a couple of years in the pros, and he's like, you know what? I made some money. I'm getting out of here. I don't even like baseball. I don't want to do it. Say, like, exactly. Like Andrew whatever. Luck just retired from football. Mm-hmm. Um, now, he, he had had a bunch of injuries in a row, but he's a Stanford grad. He's like, I have other interests. But you can still be, the. you're right, you can still be very good at something that you do not enjoy at all. Happens all the time. Yep. In fact, most people could probably think of things themselves. I was really good at math. I didn't love math. Right. I liked that math made sense and there was an actual answer that was like... That is gratifying. I got the right answer. I got the right answer. Yeah. And I like that you're either right or wrong and it's not like subjective. I either did this math problem correctly or I didn't do it correctly exactly. and I need to learn how to do it correctly. Yes, I'm missing a step. I, I, I'm doing something wrong and it's simple. Oh, this is the mistake you made. It's right there. You can isolate it, look at it, figure out why it's wrong. Yep. That I like about math. I didn't like love math. I was good at it. Exactly. And I'm sure all of you can think of something that you were excellent or good at or really good at that you don't like. So Stannis is good at doing this. It's just that he hates it. Now... And he's a... And any person... This is something else that I wanted to work into the equation a little bit. Any person that is as brilliant a battle strategist as Stannis is... Battle strategy is about what? Deception, surprise, marshalling your resources. That's politics. Mm -hmm. It's just the bloodiest form of politics. Mm -hmm. It's the same game played differently. Because you have to think ahead and anticipate and make your moves based on that anticipation. And you have to be smart enough to anticipate and react to something unexpected and decide a good thing to do about it. Come up with a good solution to the thing. Now, politics is different. Word playing, whether or not he's super good at word playing and stuff like that. that. But it doesn't mean that he doesn't understand. Oh, no, he fully understands what's going on. So I guess um, this isn't a podcast that's going to provide you with a lot of answers. I know we've done this before, and I'm sorry. <laughs> we ask more questions than answers. But like, I just um, it's just something that I wanted to talk about out loud. I was really hoping I'd come to more of a, a conclusion or at least a something I could like wrap my mind around. But um, you know, there's some things in the story that no matter how I twist my, I do mental gymnastics. I, I can't make sense of it, and. Uh, like, the only thing that could almost maybe make sense is that George is showing us slightly in some weird indirect way mm-hmm. how dangerous being a fanatic could be. That is an excellent, excellent theory on why that on, is existing. On how she can just, even though everything in the world that's tangible tells her that this is not the case. Mm-hmm. Even things she made she herself. She believes it anyways in spite of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Okay, because that could be Because she is such a fanatical believer in the need for this or whatever. Mm-hmm. That she is able to... They will do mental gymnastics. All they sorts will say, of They will gymnastics. say to themselves, no, I didn't do that. That's, that's real. That sword's real. That's like the people... Who are so diehard believers in the book of Genesis, I think it is, that even when you show them conclusive evidence that part of the earth is a billion years old or whatever the hell it is. It can't be. They're like, no, it isn't. It's only a few thousand years old. You're like, dinosaur bones. Okay. Like, like it, it, it's like when you're talking to someone like that and you're like, it's like that's not a besmirchment on someone who, who is like religious. No, it's just no, like no. when you allow it, any ideology or religion, or when it's taken to its ultimate extreme, extremism is dangerous. Mm-hmm. Fanaticism is a form of extremism. Extremism can get people to do the most unbelievable things. The Nazis convinced a decent enough German people that yeah. it was socially and morally acceptable to kill Jewish people. Any idea, I like, I like that because you can convince yourself if you're trying to reach what you believe is a truth. Yes. You, people will do anything to get to that truth in their mind. Yes, which is why, like, even what we do, 
you don't want to come to a conclusion before you start researching for no, a video you don't. because you might end up doing mental gymnastics to come to the conclusion that you wanted it to be. Okay, is this um, something that I was talking to, I think it was Mauro. This kind of is like that wizard's rule, number one. Oh, from the Sword of Truth series. Yes. People believe, what is it? People... You can get anybody to believe pretty much anything if they fear that it might be true. Okay. Or if they really want it to be true. And in Mel's case, it would be the want. Yes. I mean, uh, Terry Goodkind phrases a little bit more harshly. Basically, the moral of the story is that people are stupid and you can convince large portions of people and oftentimes individuals of something that they either really want to be true or would be terrified that it is true. Yep. Okay. Okay. I see. So, all right. I get it. Those yep. are like two cracks in people's ability to be objective. I believe that to be true. It, it is an interesting observation. And if you look historically speaking, you can convince people of stuff that are asininely ridiculous. There's that magician guy who flies. He's not flying. There's some trick that he does. Yeah. He's not actually flying through the air. I, I don't understand how he does it. But like on a more like tangible level, like say a girl fears that her, her boyfriend is cheating on her. Like as an example. There you go. She now is convinced. She can now, he didn't pick up the phone. That's what he's he doing. He was late. He did. Now she's coming up with the, the evidence. But it's make-believe evidence. Right. Okay. And in Terry Goodkind's world, if you will, is it always incorrect evidence? Or is there sometimes true evidence as well? Well, it's oftentimes used in the in the book. The first time that it's used, there's a mob that showed up it at the most powerful wizard's house, mm -hmm. and he's been living pretending not to be a wizard in a land that has no magic. Okay, magic doesn't exist there. Mm -hmm. But he's the most powerful, one of the most powerful wizards in the world. He just lives there under the auspices of being. A nice old guy who's good at like potions and healing and right. stuff like that. And then a couple of weird occurrences happen. People have been freaking out, worrying about magic. And they show up at his house and they want to kill him. Even though he did nothing. Yes. And because he, now there's a movement against magic. Yes. All right. And then he actually, by the time it's all said and done, he admits that he is a wizard to them. And, be, and tricked all of them into thinking that he made their balls disappear and that he'll give them back to them if they apologize and go home and all the guys like went like and he, he was so good at using language wow. to deceive the people that he convinced a mob of men that he made not the whole thing but their balls disappear even though the balls were still there and the balls were still there and all the guys were like Okay, that, that's it, what's and, happening and in it spread, And it spread like panic amongst their ranks. And they were all like, and, and then he like told him he wasn't going to give them back. He's like, now get out of here. And they're all like begging him to give them their balls Mel back. has missing balls phenomenon. Yes. From Terry Goodman. <laughs> that, that's the first time that it's introduced that's in that insane series. It's right at the beginning And it's of the just series. a simple use of language. Yes. He convinced them that one of their greatest fears had come true. And all of their fear was to lose their balls? Every single guy there? You've, you're not a man. Obviously. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're obviously not a man. So, so let me get this straight. Hold on one minute. It's every man. It, it, it's part of every man's most prized possession. And so if I were to say to a group of guys, your worst fear has come true. Every guy is going to go for their crotch and feel there. Like something might do. Something that is hilarious. And I never would have thought that. Something terrible has happened. That's it. To my so, reproductive organs. That is hilarious. Yes, that's where every guy's mind's going to go immediately. Oh my God. And that's why men are from Mars and women are from Venus. But like, all right, I, okay. So that's, that could be what's at play here. George is having, Melisandre she knows for a fact. She wants it to fact. be true so badly that she has convinced herself it's true. She will though, abandon all reason. That's what she had to actually, literally abandon all objectivity and reason to accept that notion and she did it anyways oh she did it so she a hundred percent believes that stannis is azor a high and that's why people like that are dangerous period i'm sorry they are 
That's why fanaticism is so dangerous. In whatever form you want to call it religion, you want to call it in a belief in X, it's dangerous. Yeah, of like a political movements that result in mass genocides or mm-hmm. mass murdering half of your population or religious freaking crusades where they were just killing each other yeah, by it's the not thousands cool. mm-hmm. over nothing. Um, over a disagreement about something that none of us can prove right or wrong. And you know what you see a little bit of that with the rabble rousing? What the the doom has come. Like, and you get these guys and they're talking all this craziness and all of a sudden everybody's yelling with them. You know? Like, that's scary. It's amazing. Like, have you ever looked at mob psychology stuff? No. And how... Oh, it grows. It, it, and it, how the more people you put there and, like, really good organizing people that are going to try to fire up a crowd, they have 50, 100 people in the 1,000-person crowd that are there. That are there to be among the most rowdy people because everyone else will go with them. Yes. It's a momentum. The guy up there is getting people fired up, but they're like, eh, I don't really know. But if there's 50 or 100 you people who are, dudes. and they're spread out yeah. throughout the crowd, and they are diehards, and then the other people will start cheering with them. It, it's, it's like amazing how quick quickly the professionals can get all of the non-professional people all chanting something stupid. Top of their lungs. Um, See, that's a, that's, a, that's a really interesting phenomenon that, that I'd love book, to look that into. That book that I... Um, Reference, I, I read it years ago, the Saul Linsky book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He references... Doing that. Like... And how kind of actually... I don't simple. know if it was in that one of his, in that book of his... Rules for it, Radicals? It was Rules for Radicals. He wrote multiple books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that that's one of the things that he has said. Well, it makes sense. You can sense. get the whole crowd doing it if you have a, people spread out through the crowd who are echoing what you're saying. And they're, they're in do- the front. In the front, in the middle, on the right, in the left, in no, the back. No, echoing with the guy at the front that's speaking at the podium oh, yeah. is what I meant, yeah. And they're like, yeah! And then the other people will start being like, yeah! I see, okay. It's like an amazing phenomenon where all reason is abandoned in a crowd. And now I'm, and just, people, I'm just part of this movement, this thing, this this group. Exactly. And the people will all act like as one. That's really scary. Even though... If they weren't standing with that crowd and that guy, and they were watching that guy on TV. Not same effect. They would change the channel. Mm-hmm. It's a feeling. It's an energy. Yes. And that's And it's spreads. like contagious in a big crowd and you can get all of the people. That's really freaky. It's really freaky. Politicians are masterful at it. That's why they do rallies. Yes. What do you think it's called a rally for? Yeah, or the, the pep rally in high school yeah, or whatever that does. Yeah, you guys actually did those. I don't think that my yeah, we, high school actually oh yeah, had we, them. We did them so oh, ugh, I hated it. But um anyway, guys, it's getting a little bit uh late and uh I definitely just wanted to make sure that we got this done. And um I think that we maybe came to the most reasonable conclusion one could draw with regarding that discrepancy. It's the only thing that makes any sense to me. I mean, there's obviously, it doesn't mean that I'm right. Or no, no, no. It's just, I think that's, <clears throat> I agree that's as logical of a conclusion that I can draw with the amount that we have about Melisandre thus far. Yeah, I mean, we need more of her point of view cha- chapters. If it's something else. More. With what's there so far, it's just a, it's just a function of her fanatical thinking. Or like, that's not, like he's doing like an expose on how dangerous being a fanatic can be. Mm-hmm. Because she absolutely knows that that's not the real thing. And if it's not the real thing, then there has to be someone else who has the real thing. If the real thing exists somewhere, you, you have stopped looking for it. Mm-hmm. And, and that, and that goes to eggs. what we think is the dangerous thing in people looking for this one person that's going to save you. All right, I think it's probably time to wrap this up. So I hope all of you enjoyed our discussion of Melisandre's fanatical ability to dismiss anything that doesn't fit her view. And uh, feel free, please, to leave a comment below if you guys have any observations or anything or think we missed anything, and make sure that you like this. Subscribe, hit that notification bell, share it, do all that good stuff, and we'll see you next time.